Welcome to our last show for the summer. We're the next show. We aim to shift your perspective on digital business, and we're doing so by inviting a diverse range of international doers and thinkers to our next stage. Unbelievably, we've been streaming the show regularly into your homes, offices, or home offices for over a year now. And in case you're new to our audience, I would like to express my special welcome to you and I'm more than happy to introduce you to your hosts for the next hour. There's David Merton calling in from London. He's a trend watcher, author, and our next keynote in residency. Hi, David. Good hey to there, you. everyone. Hi. And coming to you from Amsterdam is my dear colleague, event expert and program curator, Monique von Dusseldorf. Great to have you, Monique. Hello. And my name is Ina Feistrutzer. I'm a content-driven marketing expert at Accenture Interactive and the chief editor of our next conference. And currently, I'm standing in our studio in the lovely city of Hamburg. For our grand next show season finale, we are thrilled to welcome a very special guest today. She's a best-selling author, futurist, CEO advisor, and founder of her own company, Amy Webb. Amy writes extensively about uncertainty, futures, emerging technologies, and foresight strategy. And who better to ask what awaits us in the post-COVID era than her? But before we welcome Amy to our stage, let's find out what's been going on out there lately and what David and Monique have observed. I will hand over to David and Monique now and join our live audience in the chat. And David, please tell us what caught your attention lately. Thanks, Ina. Two stories caught my attention this week, both related to a long-standing obsession that people have heard me talk an awful lot about, the metaverse, the rise of virtual and simulated worlds as domains of all kinds of human experience. So two of them. First was Andrew Yang, who is, or I should now say was, and I'll get to that in a minute, was a candidate to be mayor of New York City. He took his campaign to the metaverse. He held a campaign event inside a platform called Zepito. And Zepito is a platform where people can make their own avatar and go inside this shared virtual online world and just hang out. So he held an event in there called An Evening with Andrew Yang, and he gave a speech and he answered some questions, just a very sort of typical political campaign event. Uh, it didn't really work for him because today he has announced that his uh, candidacy is over. He cited lack of support. His candidacy didn't work out. But it just strikes me as such a powerful sign of what is to come. You know, we talked a lot in this show last year about Fortnite and the metaverse. We saw Travis Scott do a concert in there. 12 million people joined live to watch that concert. In a world where those kinds of things happen, politicians are going to go into the metaverse. They're going to go into virtual and simulated worlds to reach audiences, to reach voters. So Andrew Yang was the first or claims to be the first. I think he is. It didn't, it, it didn't make him mayor of New York City. But I think we're going to see a lot more of this to come. And speaking of Fortnite, my second, the second thing that caught my eye on this is that this week Facebook acquired what is essentially the Fortnite of VR. They acquired a video game, a virtual reality video game called Population One, which is very Fortnite-like. It's sort of a big battle royale game in virtual reality. It's just super interesting to see what Facebook and what Mark Zuckerberg are doing. You know, regulators are still coming to terms with the implications of Web 2.0, which is a phrase you don't hear that much anymore. Um, they're still getting to grips with things like, you know, links to news websites. Uh, and in the meantime, the Zuck is building a position in the next iteration, the next version of the Internet, which he clearly believes, and I think most people believe, is the metaverse, is virtual and simulated worlds. Uh, It's just a very interesting time to see that play out. Keep your eye on politics in the metaverse. Keep a close eye on Facebook and the metaverse. Their big VR world horizon is still in beta, but it's going to be launched soon. Um, yeah, those are my two tips. Keep your keep your eyes close on those two things. How about you, Monique? What's what what caught your eye this week? Oh well, you know the metaverse being built out as we speak. I 
I completely agree. And I think it feels also a little bit like we're on the cusp of a new kind of internet, like we're going from the two dimensional web to a three dimensional web space where we could also meet in new ways. And, and I'm obsessed with all these new ways we can get together. Um, but as you point out, some really big companies are battling out there and Epic Games recently got a, together a cool $1 billion to build out its version of the open metaverse. And of course they have Fortnite, but they also have Unreal Engine, which now renders perfect virtual worlds. And you see that in movies and city planners are using it. And Nvidia is using the most powerful supercomputers to make a 3D map of the world. And even Apple seems to be moving forward towards a more stylized virtual 3D presence. I don't know if you saw this last conference with all these virtual emojis in the audience. But at the same time, I also think something else is happening. And I mean, I'm not a specialist in this at all, but it is as if by being connected to everyone and everything all the time through the internet, we are also understanding and learning more about existing connections in nature. And it's as if the internet has made us understand how deep interconnectedness can exist on all kinds of levels. And uh, somebody used a term this week that I liked, which like not artificial intelligence, but natural intelligence, you know, and then I'm just reading up a little bit on this, but, you know, think of gut bacteria and the brain or fungi and roots and trees. And it seems that our natural world has all kinds of connections and secrets to be discovered. And they call mycelium, you know, one of these connecting tissues, also the Internet of nature, the connecting tissue. Anyway, we need nature for mental health issues and there are connections we miss in the digital world so far. Now, our guest is miles ahead of us as always, and we'll share some of our her thinking about biotech. I mean, we're very much looking forward to this because our guest already announced is Amy Webb herself, and she advises CEOs of the world's most admired companies, three star admirals and generals. I mean, Admirals and Generals, Senior Leadership of Central Banks and Intergovernmental Organization. She's the founder of the Future Today Institute, which is a leading foresight and strategy firm. And she doesn't just help all those super important people for undoubtedly uh, lots of money. She actually published a report which outlines all these developments, all the future trends, all the research for free. And you can read it online and it's absolutely fascinating. And if you need to do anything this summer, just, you know, pick chapter by chapter and go through it and, and realize how much is happening in so many different fields. Okay, to wrap this up, she was honored as one of the BBC's 100 Women of 2020. That's already last year. She's a professor of strategic foresight, I should speak more slowly, at New York's University Stern School of Business. Um, she's a visiting fellow in Oxford. She was a delegate at the Presidential Commission. In other words, uh, we're super, super proud that she's here. Her list goes on and is much longer. Um, and super interesting, the last little bit I will share about her. She's a lifelong science fiction fan and also collaborates closely with Hollywood writers and producers. Okay, so let's listen to Amy. Amy Webb. Hey, hi, everybody. Hey, Amy. Hey there. Hi. Um, I, I mean, I tried to read everything in your resume, but it's very, <laughs> very long. <laughs> and it's also, you posted a picture about that this week. You're also in, in judo, right? You had a first degree back belt. I saw that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm old now, so I don't practice anymore. But, uh, but yeah. Yeah, I, I actually also did a bit of judo, but I never got to black belt. I was brown belt when I was 12, so it doesn't really, really, really count. So anyway. I'm the only one here with no judo. <laughs> Maybe correct. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up. I'll try right. um, This show is all about shifting the perspective. And, um, and what I already mentioned, you give out a trend, the trend report of trend reports and, and give it out to the world. Why is that? I Maybe mean, why do you give it out to anybody that wants to read it? Why do we do this? Uh, so starting in 2006, uh, the, the methodology that I developed, I mean, anybody who works in strategic foresight is using some form of a methodology that has a couple of similar beats. I mean, everybody sort of iterates around the same basic concepts. Um, in 2006, the methodology that I developed on top of the work that came before me um, really indexed pretty heavily on a quantitative approach to signals and a quantitative approach to trends. Um, and, 
you know, all of our clients kept asking for more regular access uh, to, to information and also to develop some of that foresight capability themselves. So we started releasing the report for free and public, um, I guess, probably 14 years ago. Um, and this year's report uh, is actually a series of reports. It's it's 13. I know. Um, <laughs> and, it's actually uh, not for the show. Cool. I think there's about a thousand pages. Um, and there's a reason for that. So for something to qualify as a trend for us, it has to meet four criteria. Um, Trends are driven by basic human needs. Uh, they tend to be timely, but they persist over very long periods of time. They're the convergence of weak signals, um, and they tend to evolve as they emerge. And typically, um, the features that we look for in our pattern identification process, they tend to be present um, in something that's authentic and strategic. So we're tracking longitudinal trends, not trendy stuff. And what's in the reports um, is, is that. And they cover, this year they covered 12 different areas, uh, about 30 different industry segments. And we, we give it away because for us, the trends are the starting point, not the end point. They're the place to begin thinking about what's next. Um, the real work comes in uh, the strategic conversations that happen, which are challenging for management teams building your, your strategy, uh, building out scenarios and doing real scenario modeling, like that stuff is really hard. So we give away the trends as a way to get everybody started on that process. So you say you, you don't do the trendy stuff that is, you know, hip and happening right now, but more the, the very long trends. What What is the thing you don't do? I mean, is there something that you say like, okay, everybody's talking about this now, but it's really not the most important thing because we have much longer trends? Um, like yes. the so maybe, for instance. <laughs> maybe go, going back to what David said. So Andrew Yang is kind of a, a professional candidate, I think, at this point, um, and has done a great job. Listen, I don't, I don't know if he's ever going to get elected, um, but he's definitely changed the approach to how candidates run for office, which I think is needed, and not just in the United States, but everywhere, because he's not just like milking the media. Um, to, to try to get FaceTime, he's exploring new avenues to connect with people. Um, so getting into a multiverse, and the multiverse is kind of like second life. This is the other thing. People sometimes forget about what happened before. The metaverse is not a new concept or a new idea. There's nothing new about it. There are new modalities, but it comes from a much longer history, much longer tradition. Um, so I would say the metaverse itself is interesting, but the components parts to be paying attention to are things like the pipe. It's more boring, right? The things like the pipes and um, access and distribution, because if you're in a business, ultimately the content is interesting, uh, but it's all the other stuff that's strategic. So, so that's where you want to be paying most of your attention to. And I think companies have a hard time distinguishing between the two. Um, the content feels familiar. Uh, it's interesting. There's certainly great visuals. Um, but from a strategy perspective, uh, an executive management team needs to be looking beyond the content. All right. There we go, David, with our metaverse. <laughs> yeah, I, and I, I totally agree. And I'm, I'm super intrigued. Like, uh, if you work with trends, I th it feels like one of the big questions you get asked a lot is, how can I start to spot trends? Like mm -hmm. when clients ask you that, what kind of advice? I mean, even for people listening, you know, that we have an audience of uh, professionals listening who'd love to be able to start to start to be able to go out and spot trends of their own. Um, what advice do you give people when they ask you that? Because I'm sure you get asked it constantly. Yeah. And David, I'm sure you could ask the same question because I know you've got a long right. history, professional history in the same. So I'm curious to know what you tell them. <laughs> um, we, we made our methodology is public now. Um, so I made everything open source and public in, I don't remember what year, several years ago. Um, and you know, as with anything, um, there's studying and learning a methodology, ours or somebody else's, and then there's practicing it and getting really good at it. Um, from my vantage point, if you play an instrument, this is no different than sitting down and learning how to play piano, uh, or if you're an accountant. Uh, learning how to how to create a PL uh, with the right macros and the right formulas in your your spreadsheet. Um, it's it's the same thing. So in our case, um, 
the, the, the places where people tend to go wrong is that they're not looking at primary sources of data and information. So by the time that you read something, like our report I think is very useful, um, but if you're gonna do this work on your own on behalf of your organization, you have to start um, getting much closer to the source of the information. It's kind of like, like the analogy would be like an edge computing, you kind of need to do like edge research, right? Um, we do this heuristically and in an automated way. So we use natural language processing and some automated tools to help us scrape um, everything for weak signals that because of our own cognitive biases and cognitive limitations, uh, we wouldn't be looking at on our own. But then we do heuristic evaluations, uh, which comes with practice and again, like using somebody's method. We, we have our 11 sources of macro change which is the framing that we use to start looking um, for signals. And then we have a, a framework called Cypher, which is an acronym that, that helps us find patterns, contradictions, inflections, changes in practices, things like that. I'm curious, what do you what do? You do? What do you tell people, David? Yeah, that, I mean, we're, uh, uh, there's a danger that we turn this into a foresight <laughs> practitioner's um, symposium. Don't worry, don't worry. I could, I'll touch you in a second. Go ahead. <laughs> I could, I could, I could ask you so much more about that and listen and listen all day. I mean, it's so fascinating that you're using, you know, natural language processing, and we can talk a bit in a second about how that and how GPT three, which you, you know, which you wrote about in the re in the fascinating report, you know, the implications of that for other businesses. I mean, as you say, you know, that there's a kind of bedrock trend methodology that. Um, that, that feels pretty established. Uh, um, you know, I was at, I worked at a place called Trend Watching before becoming independent. Uh, we we were obsessed with uh, you know, and as you talked about basic human needs and just encouraging clients to you, you know, I mean, you can you can look out to the world with your own two eyes. You can you can develop much more advanced ways of scraping information from the world that are super useful, like natural language processing. Our big obsession, I mean, and still remains my big obsession, was, as you said, to to encourage people relentlessly to, you know, see see this see this data they were drawing down and see the world around them and the innovations they were seeing around them through the lens of basic human needs, and and that is a really powerful way, you know, to again as you talked about like distinguish what's like trendy and kind of what's what people are talking about um from what's a truly meaningful trend that's come from somewhere you know and is going somewhere and is founded in some some truth about human beings you know i think that i mean trend watching never got to the, to a place where it was applying those kinds of technologies i think if you're doing that too if you're doing what you're doing which is applying those kinds of technologies scraping tons of data um that's amazing but 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 if you scrape in all those data of getting all those data what, can you mention uh, a trend or a discovery that you honestly wouldn't have thought of at all because you know the system said look 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 here something's happening here can you give an example of that sure so um again if you're looking for we're interested in early, early stages stuff, uh, which means that we're scraping um, international patent and trademark databases. And we're, we're not looking at titles, we're looking for instances of repetition. Um, we're looking at early funding rounds, we're looking at pre-pub academic research. So, you know, when, when you were doing that type of research, it's hard to find patterns because those patterns sometimes haven't emerged in other, other ways. Um, I will tell you that Again, where this where this works come in, comes in really handy is in making connections between things. Um, so from our vantage point, you know, in the United States, um, a couple of years ago, we started to build a model because it looked like Amazon was maybe building smart city infrastructure in a way that we had never seen before. Um, and in fact, that's what's happened. Uh, the last week. Um, a program called Sidewalk went live. It's an opt-in or it's an opt-out system, but uh, basically it creates a, a mesh network at the scale of a neighborhood. Um, and anybody within that mesh pools resources between devices. At the moment, Alexa or yeah, Amazon powered devices. Um, and if somebody's network goes out, that's great. Somebody else hops on, but it's actually more than that. 
And in a lot of neighborhoods, people have smart cameras, they've got smart alarm systems, they have all of the functionality that a top down city, smart city infrastructure, including a like a dashboard with machine learning and computer vision and image recognition and all of that stuff. Um, we've seen those initiatives fail over and over again when they're top down. When a provider comes to a local city government, um, it, things fall apart everywhere, not just in the United States. That has been true of Europe. That has been true of Japan. Um, that, that has been true just about everywhere besides China. Uh, why? Because nobody wants that type of surveillance. So here's the interesting thing that I think if, you know, we, we sort of figured out very early, and that is that if you enter at the consumer level, and if it's the people who are buying the products themselves, installing the products, maintaining the products, everything else, um, then, then that network gets built from the ground up. And it, 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 it's an interesting loophole. Uh, it no longer requires city council approval, doesn't require infrastructure because the devices create the infrastructure themselves. And on the other side of this, Amazon can sell data back to law enforcement, which is a lot of times what these smart city dashboards are required for anyways. So like you would never have found, you would never have connected those dots if you hadn't been methodically looking for signals and then mapping those signals against pattern recognition. So this is not enough, like there's different, I just want to point this out because there's totally, there's many different ways to do trends. Um, you know, Faith Popcorn, who precedes both David and myself, was was working in the marketing space and a trailblazer and was talking about changing consumer behaviors before anybody else was really doing that. These were sort of broad, um, broad ideas that were meaningful and still are. She still works, right? Meaningful um, to, to certain segments. Um, in, the, in the space that I operate, you know, we're working with executives who are, you know, C-suite or heads of R&D, heads of strategy. We need to get um, much earlier in the process to help them figure out, you know, where's their risk? Where's their growth? What is it that they should be doing? What does the strategy look yeah. like? Yeah. So. Okay. I, I know you since you follow so many different trends, it's very tempting to, to ask you all about the trends that you know, I know most about, but it's probably much better to ask you about the trends I know least about. And the biotech part is one of one of those. It's pretty new. I mean, it's it's not new as a as a an industry, but it's pretty new to have it turn up so strongly in a report that touches on all industries. Why do you think the biotech part is so interesting, not just for us as human beings and the biotech industry, but for all industries? Why why should right. we all care? Right, so so as far as I'm concerned, biology is the most important technology of the 21st century. Um, we just haven't been talking about it in that way. Um, over the past uh, maybe 20 years, there's been significant investment, development, some uh, groundbreaking research um, in, in an area of science that combines engineering, computer science, uh, artificial intelligence, logistics, uh, computational design, stuff like that. And, and broadly speaking, it's called synthetic biology, um, which is analogous to uh, how we think of artificial intelligence. AI is kind of a, 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 a phrase that, that means everything and nothing. Um, because when we talk about AI, it's an umbrella term for many, many other technologies. So synthetic biology, same deal. And the goal with synthetic biology is to redesign life um, to improve it for different purposes. And I'm not talking about designer babies. Um, we're actually talking about uh, many more profound applications. So this would range from um, synthetic, uh, a, a synthetic approach to creating seeds, to creating new types of plants that can be grown indoors um, or can withstand climate change, inventing artificial leaves uh, that can um, that can create uh, tremendous amounts of nitrogen um, that are totally organic and from nature uh, and can be extracted from that and, and work as a fertilizer. So it's, it's stuff like that. It's enzymes that eat plastic. Um, it's self-healing, self-repairing coatings. One of the things we know to be true is that smart glasses are coming to market over the next 18 to 24 months. I'm somebody who's had glasses on my face since I was six years old. I have scratched and destroyed many pairs of glasses 
And my husband is an eye doctor. So he's seen a ton of people who have scratched um, and destroyed their glasses. Um, the, what's coming on the horizon is a lens um, that, that you can't break. And if you stop and think about it, you know, like a lot of people have broken computer screens or screens on their phones, which is annoying. But if you've got a broken screen on your face and that's your primary communication device, right? You're gonna need something that doesn't, that, that doesn't crack. At any rate, so there's all that stuff. Plus, um, if you're somebody who had the Moderna or the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine for COVID, that came from synthetic biology. So that's yeah. messenger RNA, which is again, using a computer to rewrite code, having have an and old process to get there. Um, synthesizing that virus or sequencing the virus, synthesizing it, getting it into production, being able to print the, the genetic material um, so that it could then get through the supply chain. This is an enormous industry that requires 5G and pretty soon 6G. It's gonna require um, new approaches to robotics and collaborative robotics, certainly art art artificial intelligence. And this changes everything once we have the capabilities of designing or redesigning life. You you, are, you were pretty pessimistic in your book about how you know a few big companies are running the whole AI game and that the Americans have never seen this as a, a public space. How's that? How's I mean, is the same pessimistic view also valid in this space? <laughs> um, uh, so I would say yes, but I'm a little bit more hopeful. I actually have a book coming out all about this. It's called the um, the Genesis machine, and it launches in February. Um, I think there's a there's a couple of key points of difference. So AI has been in some form of development since for hundreds of years uh, in the modern era since the late or the middle 1800s. Um, what we have seen happen between uh, the, the the famous meeting that happened at Dartmouth in 1956, uh, where the the term artificial intelligence was coined to today is that there was a lot of excitement, a ton of investment, and then a winter, an AI yeah. winter in the 80s, followed by um, a lot of independent work. And now, you know, everybody's everybody's excited again. But what happened was, in addition to funding, compute, like the, the, the computers weren't, they didn't exist yet, um, yeah. that, that were capable of doing uh, what had been theorized. We're kind of in a situation on the bio, so, Anyway, so what wound up happening in AI was um, by the time all of this happened, you needed more investment, you needed more people left unchecked, which is what happened. Uh, China went one direction, the US went another, and the EU went yet another direction. Um, oh, and a little, and bit, a little bit more privacy aware, at least. But yeah. The EU is regulating. Yeah. Um, the US is building in a way that does not put any of this in the public interest. And China has a very top-down approach that, that views uh, global AI supremacy and, and hegemony, as well as synthetic biology and biotech hegemony as a key to its long-term survivability. Um, so it's a geopolitical move in, in China. It's a little different in synthetic biology. Um, we, we have much more a much more diffuse ecosystem. We don't yet have um, all of that consolidation, but the stakes are greater. It, it's the stakes are much higher when it uh, in synthetic biology because we don't have global norms and standards. We we have some regulation, but the regulation has more to do with product than it than it does process. That's true in the EU and in the United States, yes. where people are very concerned about GMOs, and so that's what gets regulated because it's politicized. Yeah. Um, so in some ways, this is a much more complica complicated, but much more important um, issue for us all to be thinking about. Hmm. It sounds, like, was, you, yeah. it, it sounds ahead, like, like you're broadly in favor of the approach the EU is taking to to AI. Um, you know, I'm I'm not. Uh, here's uh -huh. here's the problem. You know, what, what what does it take? Regulation is not enough. Um, so, so what does it take to solve the issues that we have with AI, some of which have to do with consolidation, some of which have to do with China? And I'm not like a, a, a I think there's, a, there's too much China bashing that happens. This is not that. This is a, a you know, this is, this is a futurist who does longer term modeling and is concerned about democracy and the freedom of the press. As, as we are speaking right now, um, the Beijing shut down a bunch of uh, 
an investigative news organization in Hong Kong. Yeah. That wasn't, it wasn't like producing crappy news. Uh, they were, they were just doing the job that you would hope they would be doing in Germany, in the UK, in the United States. So I'm not in favor of that. Um, I'm not in favor of how uh, some populations are being uh, horrifically um, uh, discriminated against, you know, so, 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 but regulating isn't, isn't the only issue, right? Because we also have a diversity problem. Uh, we have a lot of problems. And so in the United States, there's a tension between um, capitalism and community uh, in the EU where there's not, forgive me for saying this, and there are plenty of very smart people who are working there. I mean, and, and in the UK, uh, DeepMind is, is headquartered. Arguably, they are doing best in class work. But if you look at overall populations, you know, most of the activity is happening, a lot of the activity is happening in the U.S. Yeah. Most of the, the activity is actually happening in China. The, the, the largest number of papers in AI, um, and that matters, academic papers matter a lot, they're coming out of China now, not the U.S. Um, and the EU, most of the work is on regulating. It's not in R&D. It's not in research. It's not an application. Um, so again, we have these siloed approaches. I am not in favor of siloed approaches. I am in favor of figuring out a way to incent all parties to come to the table because that is what we need for the longer term. But that's a much more challenging um, thing to do. And, and my biggest concern with the EU is, is that the EU is now creating a wedge. It, it's, it's a wedge rather than a, uh, a solution. <sighs> I'm going to go to something more pos positive, right? I mean, it, it, <sighs> well, like we, we said, I, I wanted to come back to what you think are, um, you know, you said you're using natural language processing um, in your in your trend work, which is absolutely fascinating. Like, what are some of the other, I mean, again, this is a hugely yeah. broad question, but some of the other big implications for businesses and some of your clients that you see for GPT-3, and, you know, you write a lot about GPT-3 and no code mm -hmm. in your report, um, I'm sure you have clients asking you, you know, or, or they were. I, I, that was a really positive one. I love this idea that, you know, Welcome AI will it. now come down to the level where everybody can use it and without, you know, a no-code yeah. version of AI so that you have a lot more people involved yeah. in creating new services based on AI. Yeah, no, I, I don't think this is all doom and gloom. I, I, I do want to, however, just say, like, we don't have, you know, there tend to be two camps. Either the robots are going to come and, and take our jobs and then murder us in our sleep. Uh, or the robots are going to come and, and free us all and there'll be universal basic income and everybody will be, you know, in happy land. And, you know, like, we know that that is neither one of those things are exactly the future. Uh, the harder thing to do is to come to terms with what is plausible, which means confronting our cherished beliefs and asking strategic questions about how these developments create opportunities or challenges for our business. But in order to really do that, you have to be willing to go out more than one to three years. And almost every company that we work with, you know, they, they conflate vision and transformation with strategy. So a lot of companies are, are, are sort of do these corporate three years, like cycling work, um, where the, where like a lot right now we're saying like, let's do a vision 2030 project. Um, come up with some cool ideas about the future, but they must be tied to our one year strategy. Yeah, I agree, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but you're skipping a couple steps. Um, the hard, the really hard work is to define what that transformation looks like, not aspirationally. So another place where a lot of executives go wrong is that they think about those futures in terms of their KPIs, right? We want a billion customers, we want to reduce carbon by 50%. I mean, these are like big aspirational goals. Yeah. And the problem is that those goals aren't your vision because they don't account for all of the sig all of the work, right? The signals, the trends, the modeling. That's your ask. That's the output. What would it take for you to get those billion customers in the year 2030 uh, when we're living parts of our lives online and there's automation and maybe another coronavirus? I mean, all of these other things, right? Um, so, so companies begin with these goals and then they want to only think about strategy in the one to three year range. GPT-3 and AI is a really good example of where companies are going to get stuck if they don't change their framing uh, from casually talking about KPIs in the longer term and then mostly working on the, the short term. Um, because this is an area that's in flux. 
think about the implications. This isn't just about mimicking a person. The implications of this are we're going to be moving more and more towards voice interfaces. So if you're a marketing person, your entire life up until now, I mean, in recent, recently at least, yeah. um, has been about uh, reaching people uh, and, and raising awareness digitally, but in a visual way. So what happens when this all happens in an audio way? And, and I ask companies this all the time, like who is the, what's that holistic customer journey that you are anticipating for the year 2030? When we know that the complexity of connectivity and the device ecosystem, the network challenges, like all of these things look very different. You can't start from the point where you say, well, we're gonna have a billion customers. You gotta start from the point where you say, we're gonna have, we are gonna define our customer journey like this, like in a huge, much more holistic way. And this is the this is the way we want these people to feel. And this is the conversation we're gonna be having with them. That's where you start. And then you say, okay, well, if we get this right, then our addressable market size becomes X. You know, maybe a billion is too low. Maybe you should be batting higher, right? Um, and then you work backwards from that. So most of what I'm seeing, and, and I think AI is challenging for companies because, you know, AI sort of, like I said earlier, means everything and nothing. And there's just not enough institutional understanding of, of, of what's happening. Um, but from a strategic and a management point of view, you know, our leaders of organizations have to get much better um, at having some of these strategic conversations. And they're going to have to be willing to think in the long and short term and to make those, you know, set that vision and transformation and make more incremental bets along the way, which is everybody says they're doing that. I can think of like three companies that actually do what I'm talking about. And they're very. Oh, sensitive. which three? Sure. Amazon. There's a reason that Amazon is so successful. Uh, Amazon does an exceptional job. Their leadership team do a very, so like, again, politics aside, let's just think from a business perspective, Amazon's making its market uh, and it's making multiple markets and it's doing it in a way that slowly erodes market share from everybody else because they're disrupting everything. The only way that you do that is by thinking near and long term at the same time. You've got to be willing to work on transformation because a lot of Amazon's own machine learning capabilities, their own AI capabilities are part of the flywheel that power every other part of that business, right? They're yeah. deeply, deeply yeah. integrated. Um, Nintendo is another company that I think does this really well. You know, when we when when you guys were talking about gaming earlier, nobody, like if you say what's the future of gaming? Like everybody references Fortnite, right? Or they talk about, like nobody's talking about Mario Brothers. Just out of curiosity, do any of you know when Nintendo was founded? Who? Oh. 60s oh, or something? I, Long time ago, right? Yeah, yeah, I had to write this the other day. Yeah, it was, a, it was like 18 something or something. Right, so most people associate uh, Nintendo with the 1980s. Yeah. Um, and, and they were actually founded in the 1880s. Uh, I lived in Japan for a long time and um, there's a tradition uh, that still exists. So they're these beautifully decorated handmade playing cards. The reason that I love Nintendo as an example is because Nintendo's original value chain hasn't changed, okay? So they are still a company that makes entertainment. It still requires highly skilled people. But the thing that Nintendo has done that most others, most other companies haven't is that it's always thought ahead. It's looking for signals intentionally outside of its immediate scope and figuring out what the next customers are going to want. The only the, like Nintendo in the fifth Nintendo shouldn't be in business. They've survived two world wars, uh, the Meiji Restoration. I mean, there's there's a lot that's happened, including the advent of the television. And how is some how is a playing card supposed to compete against this talking box? You know, other companies at that point would have said these are totally different things. People will always play card games, this is something different. And they didn't see it that way. They, they saw it as a signal about other types of change. Yeah, it was yeah. Nintendo that helped invent the, the, the video arcade. Um, anyhow, and if you look at their growth, they're nowhere as big as Tencent, but their margins are very healthy. Um, and they keep outperforming everybody's expectations and, and they continue to do that. And now going back to your metaverse, they're launching a totally new kind of amusement park which is based in AR. You, human, are the playing, you are the game. Once you go into this park, it's not your typical rides. 
um, you are part of a gigantic spatial computing environment. So it's a completely, it's a fundamentally different way to approach physical entertainment. Anyways. Okay, okay. Amazon, Nintendo, there's a third, there's a third. We're three companies. Oh, Let's hope it's a European company somehow, but. <laughs> What's that, a European company? Uh, <laughs> they, they, you take too long there. You take too long. Oh, dear. <laughs> We're doomed. <laughs> Okay, but yeah, it's, it's very interesting to, to see those companies that look at the world a different way. Yeah, yeah, that is so fascinating about Nintendo. I feel like we should do a next show live from that uh, from that theme park. That that would be that would be quite the episode. I would I would wait until after the Olympics and the next wave of coronavirus that I think is unfortunately going to sweep through uh, the yes. tiny island. Uh, but... <laughs> Yes, oh. that's good advice. Yeah, let, let's let's schedule it for you know a year or two away. Let's yeah. let, let things settle down first a little bit. Um, I have an audience question here actually. So audience question, and and then after that we'll have to wrap up and go to our beautiful segment. Are there trends that have been accelerated by the pandemic, apart of from e-commerce? But yes, what what has been accelerated by the pandemic? Yeah, so, I mean, speaking on video to each other. That's for sure one thing. Yeah. Right. So if we got into a time machine and went back to the year 2019 and I said the word Twilio, like unless you were specifically working in some some area of audio or you were doing some technical work, like you might not know who they are. You know, Twilio stock, I think, is up 40 percent. Um, and it's it's an, and it's because it's an intermediary. It, it helps uh, hyperscale. It, hel it helps other companies scale uh streaming audio, streaming web services and the like. Okay. I don't. Do uh, so, so I would say. You know, there are um, if, if you think in terms of a, a big force as as it being like connectivity, I think the trick here is to really get granular about all of the different uh, trends then that were accelerated as a result. So that has to do with um, telehealth and, and telemedicine um, changing um, precision uh, or personalized approaches to education in some cases, digital transformation, all of that stuff. But you know, on the science side of things, messenger RNA uh, research has been in progress now for 10 years. The, the, mm -hmm. And, you know, suddenly now everybody's very excited about the prospect of, of changing human code uh, to address issues, whether that's, um, you know, the next virus or cancer or treating yeah. aging as a pathology rather than a inevitability, right? That, that leads to immediate death. Um, or death over a longer period of time. So there, there has been quite a bit. And it's also, the pandemic is also part of the reason why our trend report was bigger. Um, I think we had a, I forget the percentage, it might've been like 28% um, more trends. And it's, it's because, you know, the emergence of the pandemic and our response to it effectively reset the, the playing board in a yeah. lot of industries. Yeah. And I hope, at least I hope that, through the pandemic, scientists suddenly are new heroes again. So, you know, there might be well, a big influx into the science so uh, sector. That's an interesting point. Um, there's some data. I'm always curious about uh, consumer sentiment. I don't love consumer insights data because I think it's not always collected in the best possible way, which makes it not super useful. But in the case of science, um, a, Pew, a couple of recent Pew studies in the United States, so this is not necessarily true outside the US, show that scientists are rated very high for trust, like very, very high. People trust scientists um, and put them in the same spot as their religious leaders and write ultimate trust. Um, and yet the the trust in science itself is a bit <sighs> low. So but that's yeah. a, so that's a signal. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the yeah. signal is this tension between trust in the profession and the person and and no tr or very little trust in what that person is saying. P people are. That's strange. a tricky one. People are strange. Yes, it's true. That is a tricky well, but, so, one. But, but this is where so this is where we would stop or you should stop and say why. Right. So futurists mm. ask a ridiculous, annoying number of questions. Um, so this is, this is exactly the kind of data point, the kind of signal that a team, somebody listening should, should stop and say, well, I wonder what is the cause of that? And yeah. how does the cause of that, can, can I, can I draw a line, a connection between me or my company or my team or my project, whatever it is, and this phenomenon, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, and just ask why, and what does this mean? 
and what are the potential next order impacts? I mean, really, a futurist it spends a lot of time practicing something called reperception, which is trying to understand using a different mindset um, the, the signals that are currently present. It's a way of getting at our, out of our, our own ways. Okay, one more question and then I'll hand you over to David. Um, let's imagine you do a few more years of trend watching. You see all these huge big trends. You have a particular idea of what the relation should be between tech and society and government. Would you ever consider going, you know, being in charge of a government department or run for president? I mean, would you see your whole at the other side at some point? Yeah. Um, so I, I do a lot of work with the government. I have uh, proposed a Department of the Future. I've written a policy paper for the United States government proposing a, a National Office of Strategic Foresight um, anchored in yeah. the study of, of tech. Um, I meet with elected officials pretty regularly. I, I meet with people, congressional staffers. Um, I, I meet with these people regularly. Uh, I know my personality very well. I am very self-aware, and I think I would be a complete disaster uh, <laughs> working inside of a government agency, and I don't have the emotional fortitude to run for office. So I think that means president is out. Um, I think the thing that I, I bring to the table is a very valuable outside-in perspective. Um, the thing that I have to do is trust that the people that I'm showing that perspective to um, are, are willing to confront those cherished beliefs and uh, have the political strength necessary and the will necessary to make the kinds of decisions that may be challenging in the short term, but are best for all of us in the longer term. Thank you very much. Okay, it's time for <clears throat> one last thing. Next world. Thank you, Monique. And Amy, you say you won't be president uh, of the United States. But could you be president of a different, a very different place? Because I now want to take you on a journey. Imagine, just, just paint this picture in your mind that it's the near future. There's been a crisis on planet Earth, not that hard to imagine right now. Amid that crisis, a crack team of technologists finalizes a daring plan to start a new chapter for humanity. They want to travel along with 1,000 specially selected people to a new planet far be beyond the solar system called Next One and establish a permanent base there, a new home, a new society for human beings. Amy Webb, thanks to your outstanding achievements in the fields of foresight and futures, you have been chosen to be among those first 1,000 pioneers. Before you get on the spaceship and undertake the journey, there are just five questions we would love to ask you. So, let's see question number one. Okay, question number one. Name one luxury physical object that you would like to take to your new home. Duct tape. Duct tape. Uh, duct tape. You know what that is? It's like the really strong silver... I think if you're, uh, I don't know, it just sounds to me like you're describing Ganymede and, and the Expanse, but um, but that would be hard to manufacture off planet. And I would bring as much duct tape as I possibly could. That is very practical. I love it. Okay, question number two. Which book should everyone read before they board the spacecraft to travel to next one? Um, so I guess this is another practical answer, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, the SAS survival handbook, um, most of that has to do with surviving like apocalyptic health, health spaces, hellscapes, uh, on earth, but there's quite a bit there for sort of basic, how to set up camp, how to do survivalist stuff. I think that would probably be useful. I think it would be useful. And I, I don't think much terraforming has gone on or anything before you're going to land. So... Yeah, you, you, you may well be in need of some serious survival skills. Um, OK, let's see question number three. Name one exceptional person who should qualify to be among the first 1000 pioneers. Your, your close family are going with you already. Uh, one exceptional crewmate. Can I name two? Because they're, they're kind of a, a, a set. We'll bend the rules. Yeah, sure. Okay. I would say uh, Michelle Sharpender and Jennifer Doudna. Um, they just won the Nobel for uh, CRISPR. 
Um, and if I wanted to have two minds uh, with me on this journey to in support of furthering humanity and making sure we survive, it would be those two unbelievably talented, brilliant women. I love it. Yeah. And some serious gene edited creatures and food can can result from that and it would be very useful. Thank you. Let's see question number four. Create one law that bans something from next one forever. Yeah, uh, so that would be gain of function research. Uh, gain of function research is when you take existing biological material and you try to mutate the hell out of it uh, to see how bad it might get. Um, and there's really only two reasons to do that. One is in the days before computation, which is now, you would try to anticipate mutations, but you can do that computationally, you don't need live specimens. The other is for, uh, the other reason is biological warfare. I don't think we should have either one of those things. Um, I, so I, I, that would be the first law, um, would be as we're terraforming and doing experiments and trying to survive uh, gain of function research is banned. Okay, gain of function research is out. Final question for you, Amy, name one tradition from planet Earth that you think should be replicated on Planet Next One? Live concerts, not in the metaverse, in the flesh. I like it. I, <laughs> I think that what with all the terraforming and the hard work and the, you know, the, the gene editing and the surviving, the least you could expect is that people will want to come together for music. I love it. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. It sounds like I'm, I know it sounds like I'm not going to be a fun crewmate, but, uh, and maybe I'm not, but I'll make sure everybody lives. No, no, the last one's very fun. Exactly. And, you know, you, to have fun, you first need to survive. So bring your duct tape, you know, read your survival book, and then we can start to think about, you know, live music. That feels very sensible to on me. Brand. It feels on brand for me. Yeah. Um, Amy, thank you so much for those five answers. Please board the ship. Enjoy your voyage. Uh, enjoy next one. Uh, and I think, you know, we're going to have to head into the wrap up, right, Ina and Monique? Fantastic. Thank you so much for your insights. I mean, it was absolutely fascinating. There were so many exciting talking points and then I definitely have to do some research from smart city infrastructure to Nintendo. I didn't know they were a card game before. So it was a pleasure having you as our guest today, Amy, and I truly hope that we meet in Austin next year. Also, thank you, David and Monique, for sharing this stage with me once again. We are heading into our summer break now, and I will truly miss you all. We'll miss you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but we will come up back with a special show edition at the end of September. And if everything runs as planned, we might even be able to welcome a live audience in Hamburg. So stay tuned for some news to come. And in case you watch this as an on-demand video and wish to take part in our live shows and keep up with the news, please sign up to our newsletter on our website, NextConf.eu. So thank you for watching and a big thank you to the team behind the scenes, Stefan, René, Merle, Harshit and Juliane. You did a great job in producing and promoting our show in the past months. And of course, a big thank you to our partners, Accenture Interactive, Factor 3, our media partner, T3N, and our live stream and video partner, 23. Hope to see you all in summer in real life or on the screen. Thank you.